frankincense, sandalwood, lavender, myrrh. These are the words of power of the most ancient form of the occult arts, herb magic. Hello, I'm Scott Cunningham. For the next hour, I'll be your guide into the world of incenses, oils, and brews. Thanks for coming along for the journey, and I hope you enjoy this introduction to green magic. Now, I've written several books on the subject, and planned several more. The books are limited to words and pictures. In this video, I'll show you how to do some of these facets of herb magic so that you can see them actually being done. The best way to learn is by doing. And I hope this video will help others to learn and investigate the practices of herb magic. If you think this idea is absurd, the fact that tiny plants can possess amazing powers, think of the white willow. For centuries, herbalists used its powers to relieve muscle pain and spasm. Then science discovered that it actually did relieve pain, and this is still used as a basic ingredient in aspirin. Herbs contain real powers and energies which work on both the physical and the spiritual realms. But don't take my word for it. Try out a few of the simple herbal spells shown here. You'll know by your results if herb magic is effective. Herbs are usually strongly scented, clue to their powers. Now, magic is a ritual process in which we direct natural forces to bring about needed changes into manifestation. Does that sound vague? Well, yes, it is vague. Magic is as hard to define as electricity or love, neither of which is completely understood by scientists. I don't know everything about magic, but I know how to make it work. In natural magic, you achieve an understanding of it which can never be shared in words. Now, putting together these two definitions, herb magic is the use of little-known powers of nature to cause needed change. These energies are aroused, attuned, released, and directed towards the magical goal. There are many ways of accomplishing this, and some of these will be shown here. Now, if you want to practice herb magic, keep one thing perfectly in mind. This is an absolutely natural practice. There's nothing supernatural about it, for how can anything be outside of nature? Nature is all. Magic's, magic is an organic art. Well, this doesn't mean we eat granola while casting spells, uh, though this perhaps does happen. No, magic is a cooperative process between the earth and the magician. Since magic is natural, it possesses its own set of laws. Not rules and regulations, but the results of centuries of observation. For example, herb magic usually isn't instantaneous. Tying a money sachet around your neck won't materialize a thousand dollar bill in your pocket. What it will do is surround you with money attracting energies. Now, these energies, combined with your own involvement with your need, will draw money to you. Similarly, though a love oil might not attract your ideal mate overnight, it will widen your options, eventually leading you to him or her. Magic can be fun but it should be done with serious intent. Doing an incense spell, for instance, just for fun, will produce no results. However, the same spell, when performed with serious intent and emotional involvement, can have fantastic results. And while it's perfectly acceptable to work magic for your own gain, selfishly manipulating or hurting others is not. Obviously, just like in real life, practitioners of harmful magic eventually wind up in psychological or metaphysical ruin. Now think for a minute. In most of the movies you've seen, hasn't the evil magician ended up fried to a crisp? It's usually the case. So know that magic works, that it should be done with serious intent, and it isn't used to harm others. It also works along natural lines. How does it work? Through vibrations. This plant contains a huge store of energies waiting to be released through your touch and magical intent. The plants in your garden, the weeds growing through the sidewalks, the flowers in the jar on the table, all are storehouses of energy. It's possible to feel these energies. Those of us naturally psychic will have a little trouble feeling them, but anyone can with practice. Take any living plant. Rub your palms together for a few seconds. Shake them off as if they were wet, and then hold them a few inches above the plant. It is beaming out its energies to you. You may feel them as waves of heat, pulses of energy, or simply as a sort of hum. Your palms may tingle or vibrate. 
These are all reactions to the plant's powers. Try this exercise once a day for a week using a different type of plant each day and note their varying levels of energy. In their own way, plants speak to us. Each plant possesses distinct powers. Each type of plant possesses equally distinct energies. Some plants, such as garlic, have strong authoritative powers and so are used in spells of this nature, protection, exorcism, things like that. Others, like roses, have gentler vibrations and stimulate the love centers of the brain. These are used in such spells. You can discover all these varying energies within plants on your own by working daily with herbs. Or get a good book and read up on herbs, then experiment to see if you agree with the author's information. In the past, magic was ruled by the heavens. Herbs were collected according to lunar phases. Constellation's first appearance on the horizon was greeted by specific spells, and planetary positions dictated certain rites. While this is still true today, many magicians share the view that since the powers at work in magic, plants, stones, the earth, our own energies, are linked to universal energies, and indeed are manifestations of these universal, universal energies, perfect magical timing isn't necessary. Some think otherwise based on experience. That's fine for them. I just feel that though timing can help a spell, even just by keying into the magician's imagination through ritual associations, perfect magical timing isn't necessary. Harvesting herbs is an important part of magical herbalism. In a sense, when you harvest a plant, you're asking it to give up its life to further your own magical goals. So it's important to attune and respect the life force within the plant before harvesting it. One of the ways we can do this is to make a sacrifice by burying something precious or semi-precious at the base of the plant prior to harvesting. Here I am planting an amethyst crystal to give power and strength to the plant as I cut it. You can also attune with the plant by just touching it and feeling its energies and letting them mix and mingle with yours to attune with it before you ask it to make its sacrifice. After that, take a knife, it needn't be one like this, and cut very gently sprigs of the plant. It's very important not to cut or collect plants or collect from plants or herbs that grow by polluted or stagnant water by busy roadways, anywhere where they may have been sprayed with pesticides or chemicals, and never collect more than 25% of the plant's growth or from very young plants. Harvesting herbs is basically the beginning of magical herbalism, because once you ask the plant to give up part of its life for your magic, you, are begun, you have begun to attune with the earth and with the powers at work behind herb magic. A few tools necessary to practice herb magic. If they are expensive or difficult to find, you can probably find most of them at your local store. This is a mortar and pestle, perfect for grinding herbs to a powder. Next, a sensor, or an incense burner, necessary for burning incense. Candles, of course, are a necessary tool in herb magic. The power of flame and color is potent and easily combines with herb powder. You'll also need some large wooden or ceramic bowls for mixing. They can be of any material. Eyedroppers are very important for mixing oils and try to get bottles with eyedroppers attached to make them much easier. You also need many pieces of flannel or felt cloth of various colors. Also, natural fiber cords or yarn. It's also a good idea to keep a book of herbal notes, records of spells, and also the formulas.